how in eighth grade I had to, I took a class, a biology class, and we had to dissect frogs, and it was the, the grossest thing ever. It was just like, oh, it's just these, oh, these frogs, and it was, yeah, I'm not, not good. Um, so um, at that point, I decided I was never, never going to do anything biology again, you know, concentrated on, you know, astronomy and physics, um, until I realized that, you know, that I actually had to keep aging myself, and then I couldn't just rely on other people to do it, because if the other people, you know, tried to do it and they didn't succeed, you know, then I'd, I'd be dead, and it was, it was too risky of a strategy, so I really need to do it myself. And so at that point, I you know, ended up studying a bunch of biology and learned a bunch of biology. I grew up in southern Arizona, um, about 90 miles from the nearest city. And um, I was always, there was like really good stars in the sky in terms of like you could see the structure of the Milky Way. I mean, you, you probably had some experience, oh, I guess, yes. in, I guess in the four corners, where you can see the structure of the Milky Way. Like you can see the band, you can see the different different shapes and things like that. There's nothing quite like it. Yeah, there's nothing like concerned. it. Yeah. yeah, it's like, you know, I always, like, I, you know, wanted to see the stars, but wanted to learn about the stars, wanted to go to the stars. And eventually, I guess there was, yeah, I was thinking then, and, you know, and I was like, wow, there's, like, living a normal human lifespan and with the rate of technological progress, it's like, there's, there's no way that I'll get to the stars. And that the only way, I mean, you, you, the only way to get to the stars is to, I mean, you have to live longer, essentially. Right, so you have to see the technology. Exactly. Uh, interesting. And, and, and even the stars are like, like even going at close to the speed of light, you know, it's like they're thousands of light years away or, or millions of millions of light years away, some of the other galaxies. And just in order to go there, we need, need to live forever and that. I should probably work on that problem before, uh, 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 before working on the astronomy problem. When I was 19, when I was wanting to develop this, you know, when I was in the process of developing a strategy to, to try to cure aging, and, you know, was thinking about a lot of the, um, It's okay. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah, you yeah, can start yeah. over any Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thinking about a strategy to try to cure aging and thinking that, you know, there's some people that, you know, live to 120 and some people that die in the 60s and there's a Galapagos tortoise, you know, which can live for hundreds of years and there's, uh, and there's the bowhead whale, which can live for hundreds of years. And that, um, you know, if we could just tell the exact molecular difference between all these different species and people, then we could eventually try to de develop strategies. To so do you to... think we can actually live longer? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I... I mean, well, if we don't, then we're going to die. So. Well, yeah, and that's one thing that's guaranteed. We're <laughs> yeah. all dying, right? Yeah, yeah so, exactly. It's like, yeah. So is that the number one motivator um, for you, is that we're all going to die? How long do you want us to live? Um, millions, billions, hundreds of billions of years. That's pretty amazing. Uh, and, and the goal right now is to get to, you know, like 150 or 200 years. And then if you get to that far, far you know, in time, you'll be able to get, you know, get to 500 years, and then 5,000, and 500,000 eventually, so. So, what were you like as a boy? Like, I know it's hard uh, to uh, think uh, about uh, that, uh, right? Uh. But how do you perceive yourself as a boy? Did you have like your microscope? Like, what, what was your uh, world like? Um, did you have a microscope then? No, I didn't. You did not. You did you want in, one? Yeah, I wanted one. I mean, I grew up in really rural Arizona, so it was really like there wasn't a lot of like things you could do with technology. I can identify well, I with that greatly, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> it was a really like our nearest, you know, the nearest city of 6,000 was like eight miles away. And, we, you know, we grew up on, you know, just a bunch of desert wasteland in many ways. And there wasn't a lot of, you know, things in terms of technology that you could do. Did you have rockets? Um, no. Did you play um, games? Yeah, most, mostly like military games. Like military games, Like dig trenches okay. and things like that. And we had some neighbor, neighboring um, boys that were about our age. Um, that lived about a mile and a half away. And like we'd just play in the desert and hike and dig trenches and things. So did you have scientific aspirations as a boy? Um, when did this start? Like, oh when yeah, did when did I get, I, okay, I guess it was started in, um, when I was in seventh grade when a book on atoms, when I found a book on atoms that was um, on the bookshelf in the library. And it talked all about the history of atoms and the, the experiments that were done to verify that atoms exist and then all the different things that people have done with atoms. And I thought it was really interesting how, I guess, especially like some of the chemistry aspects, how you could like change, you know, just move a few atoms around and like change a molecule that we eat into like, like nerve gas or something. Mm -hmm. Like and just how, how close the structures were between like different things. And I was like, wow, that's really interesting how, you know, something that's I eat food versus something extremely toxic versus other things. And it's just slightly different arrangements of the atoms. What was the yeah. first experience like when you saw the book, you open it up? Yeah. I mean, there, I assume there were pictures. Yeah, those pictures. Could yeah. you visualize yeah. them? Um, eventually, yeah. It was just like, it was just like, wow, just, just reading all about them. And, you know, before I didn't really, 
like my most of my interests were in the outdoors and, and things like that that wasn't weren't really I, mean, I wasn't as interested in academics and things like that until and I didn't really like to read either until I read the book, saw the book on Adams and I was just totally blown away and I was like wow this, this is really exciting um, mm. so you pull this book off the shelf mm. and you discover Adams for the first time then what what is that um, what is that what is the next thing that happens to you I mean I read I basically started reading every book I could find about chemistry and physics and things like that. So I'm curious, did you care about school after that anymore? Um, yeah, I, I did care about school because okay. just, I mean I, I mean, I guess in some sense like I, you know, just like a lot of kids, I mean like the, the reason I sort of cared about school a little bit, I mean it was just, you know, the whole please your parents thing mm -hmm. and you know that how, how kids are like that, you know, it wasn't. Whereas like after that book, you know, and just reading like I really just, I mean it wasn't school for like, oh because it's school, it was like the, the specific things I was interested in, the specific aspects of things I was interested in. I was like, wow, this is really exciting just learning about things and so I mean most of my learning did take place outside of school though. actually almost all of it did take place just like in the library reading books. Story behind founding the company? Yeah. Um, so I guess we um, I guess we originally started the company in order to buy chemicals because it was just um, uh, so I convinced my brother to, uh, uh, to join me on the sequencing project and um, we we're trying to buy chemicals and like chemical companies don't just sell chemicals to individuals so we Imagine had to, that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I guess so. <laughs> so, we had to, so we had to incorporate a company in order to buy chemicals. And if you, you know, if you incorporate a company, then you, then you can buy chemicals. So we incorporated a company, and it was just the two of us, you know, working. We uh, rented lab space at the University of Arizona, rented about this much bench space for $150 a month, and we were able to get access to millions of dollars worth of equipment uh, uh, from that, and, um, and just worked on playing around DNA molecules and developing a strategy to try to figure out how to sequence DNA extremely rapidly and extremely cheaply and extremely extremely long read lengths. And apparently you figured that out. Yeah, yeah, yeah we figured something awesome. out. Awesome. So a lot of people are under the impression, you know, when I go out and I tell people like how amazing uh, it is that, you know, we're able to start getting to the point where we can sequence the human genome. Yeah. A lot of people already think we've already done it, but apparently we haven't. Yeah, so like the Human Genome Project, you know, which was done, you know, in like the 99, 2000 time frame, um, they sequenced about, this is about 90% of the human genome, maybe, maybe in the maybe the high 80% um, of the human genome. Uh, and since then, you know, in the intervening 10 years, with all of the you know, hundreds of millions and billions of dollars that have gone into sequencing, we've only sequenced about 92% of the human genome. Like for example, like the Y chromosome has only been half sequenced. Mm -hmm. And the reason we've, they, you know, the, the, the reason that no human genome has ever been completely sequenced is the technology just doesn't exist to be able to do that. Um, there's uh, massive repetitive segments, you know, in the human genome and um, the current methods of sequencing work by work by chopping up the genome into a bunch of really small pieces and sequencing those individual small pieces and then um, trying to assemble those pieces. But if there's a mass of repetitive structures, then you simply can't do that. Mm -hmm. And the repetitive structures are really important, like all for gene regulations and other things. So that's so. What do you think is in the remaining eight percent? So I yeah. I've heard that you know probably many of the uh, the cures for diseases, like the answers for those. Um, may, may lie in the remaining 8%, is that true? Yeah, there's gonna be some of that. I mean, a, a lot of it's also just like, because of how difficult it is even to sequence the 92%, there's lots, you know, there's like, like the standard for a good accuracy genome is, you know, it's like 99.99%, which you think, you know, six billion bases. And if you have, uh, you know, one in 10,000 mistakes, that's like, what is that? One in a million mistakes is, what, 6,000? 6,000, one, yeah, one, 10,000, that's a lot of mistakes. That's a lot of mistakes. 600,000, 600,000, yeah. 600,000 mistakes. And you think of like a cancer cell can have like six or seven mistakes and that causes the cell to become cancerous. And if you have 600,000 mistakes when you're trying to read that, it's gonna swamp out a lot of the, a lot of the signal that you get. So, right. so you dropped out of school. Yep. Okay, tell me about that. Um, I mean, I started working on sequencing and thinking about sequencing and was just spending all my time doing that. And I mean, I'd still, lived, was, for a little while I was taking just like one class just so I could maintain access to all the equipment at the university. But then eventually found I could maintain all the access without taking any classes, so then I just stopped taking any classes. Were you and, scared at all? Um, not really, I mean, just like r realizing, I guess, I guess, I guess there's another event that happened, I guess, in there that like, caused that change at 19, like when I was, you know, caused me to switch from astronomy physics. I guess I was in a bookstore and there was like all the books on like, there was like all the books on different, there's like the electrical engineering, mechanical engineering section, one thing and the travel section and then also like the astronomy section and then there's that sort of one somewhat coalesced. I was just sort of thinking about, um, wow, there's all these things I want to do and like, you know, and like 
go to the stars, do all these things. And then, but like, if I wrote a list of the, all the things I wanted to do in life, like, I would never get like one percent of them done if I live a normal life span. I mean, probably ne never, not even get like one tenth of one percent or one thousandth of one percent done. And like, the only way to get you know them all done was was to live a lot longer. And then like, once I realized that, I was like, wow, I just it's like I need to solve this problem or I'm going to die. And I'm and I'm not going to do any of these things, so it doesn't really matter in some sense. It's, you know. I guess the only other thing to do school. is like clone yeah, yeah. yourself, right? Yeah, and yeah. Maintain central control or something. Yeah, well, that's a different person. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's. I, I, I guess if I could clone myself and like copy the mind and have syncing of the mind, then that'd then that pretty, would be great. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. That's yeah. my yeah. dream. Oh yeah, well, well that's my dream also. <laughs> that's my I mean, dream. like long term, like the only you know the only long term solution is you need multiple copies of yourself. Right. Because like there's gonna be like you know like if you create you could still get hit by a boss or or a terrorist could like blow up a building or something like that that you're in, but. Or an asteroid or something like that. Because I, mean, like I think that's the one problem with living mm -hmm. forever and living mm -hmm. a long time is that you know you live your life becomes more valuable the older you get, yeah. especially if you're in good shape, yeah. right? So you live to be 300 and then you get hit by a bus. Exactly. How tragic is that? Yeah. Right. It's yeah. really tragic. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And there's some of the statistics that if you cured aging, um, and like we had the current accident rate, it's like people would live to about a thousand years, and like a small percentage would live to about 10,000 years, which isn't a very long time if you cured aging, but. I mean, I imagine people would start doing less risky things, which would, you know, increase the number. We'd probably become very um, <laughs> risk averse, I imagine. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if we would like walk around with bumpers, like yeah. <laughs> it yeah, would stop yeah. driving. Yeah, or we'll just have like a, uh, yeah, have a better world or something like that. Yeah. Maybe people would be less likely to go to war and things like that because like you know, it's too risky. Want, exactly, yeah. way too risky. You know, it's not not worth the not worth the benefits. You know, let them, you know, let them have the oil or whatever they want. <laughs>